Okay, well, our scripture text this evening is a very familiar one, and really the text we should go to whenever we want to uh, demonstrate to uh, anyone that um, man's condition, you know, whether we're arguing with another believer over the issue of total depravity, or um, whether we're trying to convince someone who is outside of Christ that they can do absolutely nothing pleasing in the sight of God because of their condition. So, let me, um, let me read Romans chapter 3, uh, beginning in verse 9. I just want to read verses 9 through 12. Um, and then think about this as Paul writes this when he says, What then? Are we better than they? He's, he's talking about the Jews. Are we Jews better than the Gentiles or the Greeks? He says, Not at all. For we have already charged that both the Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Now, there's more that he says in this text. It just kind of spells it out a little bit more, sort of unpacks what that means. But um, I think we have enough here to kind of um, get the point this evening uh, to see again uh, what our condition was, what our neighbor's condition was, but then to move on from there to why it is that our neighbor doesn't really appear to be like this. Okay. All right, so let's first of all just again remember where we are at. Uh, last week we were looking at what we should do when we're seeking to minister the gospel to someone who admits that it's true, believes it, believes the Bible, believes the gospel, believes all these things, but isn't interested in it. And that is possible. It, it, it does happen. As a matter of fact, a lot of these people may even be in, in the church, uh, particularly in the next group, because we also looked at what to do with those who believe these things and believe that they're saved. But we know they're really not, uh, not because... Um, of maybe anything in particular they're doing, though it may be, uh, but because we know that they're trusting the wrong thing. Okay, we know that within various you know, religious organizations, there are different bases upon which those who are part of it believe themselves to be safe. And it could be anything from baptism or sacraments or being a part of an organization, as we saw. Well, our approach, as we also saw, should be similar in both cases. Okay. The person who believes but isn't interested isn't seeking the Lord. The person who believes and thinks they're safe, they're not seeking the Lord either. And since both will not seek the Lord, we need to seek the Lord for them, much as we would do for our children when they're young and they cannot seek the Lord, we seek the Lord for His mercy on them. But in the case of adults, we try to motivate them to pursue Him, give them reasons why they should. And we looked at how John did this, John the Baptist, who was sent before Christ to prepare them for the coming of Christ, how he motivated them, how he showed them their need so that they would be interested in the Savior who was coming. So first of all, he reminded his audience of their condition, that they are the children of the devil. And you know, it's interesting, he didn't even have to argue the point with them. Uh, they seemed to accept it, they accepted what he was saying. The Spirit had awakened the audience. They already knew God's law. They already knew that they had broken that law. They knew from conscience that they were guilty. The Spirit of God was already working on their hearts. Now, we may not have that advantage when we come to these uh, that we're talking about. We may need to use the law to wake them up, to show them that they have broken the commandments, that they have sinned and are under God's wrath. And we also need to pray at the same time that the Spirit would do His work. You know, again, I remember that video. I think it was Ray Comfort, and they were doing evangelism. Good, doing, doing evangelism in front of, a, I think, a high school. And they approach a person, you know, a high schooler, and they say, um, you know, how do you think you're doing in the sight of God? Well, I think I'm doing pretty well. That's usually how they answered. You know, they think God approves of them and so forth. So then he would take them through the commandments, and at the end of that time, he said, how do you think you're doing now? And he goes, well, 
I guess, I guess I've, I've sinned. You know, I, I guess I'm not right with God. And, but the way they said it, you know, with sort of a smile and kind of laughed about it, it just showed that they weren't taking it seriously. Now, they might understand that they fall short, but it's a different thing actually to feel the conviction and the weight of that guilt and that impending judgment. That's something that the Spirit of God does. Now, John not only um, called them out, uh, what their true nature was. They were not children of God. They were children of the, of the devil. They were the brood of vipers. He also warned them what was ahead because of their condition, that they had to flee from God's wrath, which was coming, because he said it was near. Now, again, he may have been referring to 70 AD because that was only 40 years away. They needed to be ready for that. Or he could have been referring to the fact that they could die any time. No one knows the day of their death, and they need to be ready. And certainly, that's what we need to remind our audience of. Life is brief. Life is uncertain. And if they die impenitent, they will have to face God's judgment. Now, again, John the Baptist knew this. Of course, God sent him because he knew this was the case. We need to understand it as well. People generally do not look for a Savior unless there's something that they see that they need to be saved from. And that's the reason why we speak of God's law and his judgment for breaking that law. We need to warn them of coming judgment. And with regard to those with a false hope, remember we saw we need to kind of pull the rug out from under them. For those who are trusting in anything other than the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to be prepared to show them that only faith in Christ can save them. Anything else only gives the illusion of safety. It does not give them true safety. Well, this evening, as I've said, I want to look at another obstacle that often stands in the way of our evangelism, okay? And that is not understanding the gravity, the seriousness of the situation that our neighbor is in, or maybe not believing that they're really in that situation. They're not really as bad as the Bible makes them out to be. Now, my systematics professor, uh, uh, Robert Strimple, uh, when I was in seminary, he once told a story to illustrate this to his class, and I thought it was pretty good. He talked about a young man, and I think he was talking about a personal example, a person he knew. So a young man who had attended seminary and had adopted the biblical view, you know, that man is totally depraved and under God's wrath and he needs the gospel, uh, and Christ is the only way out. And so... He then sensed a call to the mission field. But while he was on his way, it sounded like he took, you know, maybe several public trans, you know, transportations to get where he was going. But while he was on the way, he ran into so many people who seemed so nice, you know, nice people, nicer than people he was used to running into, people that were more helpful, more hospitable, more giving than any Christians that he had ever known. And this seemed to run contrary to what the Bible taught. So that by the time he arrived on the field, he had completely lost his sense of their need and consequently his desire to reach them. You know, he no longer saw that they were in danger. Now, the thing is, the same thing can happen to us. It likely has happened to us at some level. We believe what the Bible says about our neighbor, but they just don't seem to be that bad. And so we begin questioning, perhaps, and again, this isn't just, you know, uh, let's say, our thinking by itself. We know the enemy also works to interject ideas into our mind. Hey, they're, not, they're not really that bad. You know, maybe you don't really need to stick your neck out and jeopardize your relationship with them in order to, you know, rock this boat by telling them this, this truth. And Satan will definitely try to deceive us in that way. So that's what we want to deal with tonight. And we want to, again, look at those two things. What, first of all, what the Bible says, what Paul says, about the condition of everyone who is born into this world. And then we want to try to understand why his description doesn't seem to apply with the people with whom we come in contact, okay, we come in contact with. So first of all, let's consider Paul's description of mankind's spiritual condition. As I've said, this is the classic text where we go to to, to prove this point. And I already mentioned before that I do want to personalize it so that we can at the same time be reminded of what our condition was when the Lord came to us. 
Now, what he says first is more or less a summary of everything that follows in verse 10. He says, there is none righteous, not even one. And what he means by that is this, there is no one who does what is right. And there are no exceptions. Okay, everyone does what is wrong. Nobody does what is right. Now, that's a pretty uh, bold statement because it maybe doesn't always seem that way, but we're going to see why they do not do what is right. Okay, now everyone we know has been affected by Adam's sin. He represented us in the garden. Because he was our representative, his guilt was imputed to all of us. Christ is the only exception. And because of this guilt, as we saw this morning, we forfeited the Holy Spirit. If we had been born with the Spirit as God had originally intended it to be, we would have been born good, and we would have done good things. But instead, we're born without the Spirit, and we're born evil, and we do bad things, okay? That's the reason why we're in the condition we're in, regardless of how cute our babies might be, okay? That is, in fact, what the Bible says their condition is and what our condition was. Okay, so we, as David said in Psalm 51, we were conceived and born in sin. When he says his mother conceived him in sin, he's not saying his mother was an immoral woman. He was simply saying that that is the condition of all mankind. As soon as we are conceived in the womb of our mothers and are, are part of this human race, Adam's guilt is imputed to us. We forfeit the spirit. We never actually receive the spirit because of that. And because of that, we are born in sin. We are born evil. Now, this evil affects all of our faculties. We were born totally depraved. Total depravity doesn't mean that man is as bad as he could be, and that's something we're going to again deal with. Why isn't man as bad as he could be? But it does mean that our whole being has been affected by sin. There is no part of us that is untouched by it. It didn't just affect our bodies. Okay, we know when Adam sinned that the process of death began. He started to age. It also affected our souls, our moral faculties. We saw something of that this morning, remember, that even after the fall, we still bear God's image, but his natural image, those various ways in which we are like him. We can think, we have a conscience, we, we can, uh, well, again, reason, we can imagine, we can purpose to do things, we make choices, and we're spiritual, and we're immortal, and spiritual. I think I already said spiritual, yes. Okay, so there are these ways we still reflect the image of God. But his moral image, our love for everything that is right and good, has been completely removed because we have nothing of the Spirit. Now, many professing Christians today will deny this. As a matter of fact, I was just talking to uh, one of our brothers this morning about this, that he runs into a lot of people that deny this, the fact that we are totally depraved. They don't want to think that that is the case with us. They would say, probably, um, I don't know, many professing Christians today would say that we're not totally depraved, but sin has affected us. We're mostly depraved, but we still have the ability, small though it may be, to do some good and particularly the ability we have to trust in Christ when he is offered to us in the gospel. Perhaps more alarming is the fact that there are still more Christians, more Christians, you know, professing Christians, and non-Christians alike, who believe that people really are basically good, okay? And that most are gonna to go to heaven, only the real bad people go to hell. Most are gonna to go to heaven. As R.C. Sproul said in one of our videos not too long ago, we believe in justification by death. When a person dies, they go to heaven because their good works are going to outweigh their bad. Now, as I was thinking about this, I thought of um, something that Jonathan Edwards had to say, and so I had to look it up, and I, and I, I have that quote. And, you know, if you know, if you've, you've heard me read Jonathan Edwards before, he's not the easiest to follow. I'll try to make it as, as understandable as possible. But Edwards here is saying, okay, let's say for the sake of argument, the people really do good things and they really don't do that many bad things. Is that really going to matter in the end? Okay, this, this is how he says it. He says, how absurd must it be for Christians to object 
against the, dep the depravity of man's nature a greater number of innocent and kind actions than of crimes. And to talk of a prevailing innocency, good nature, industry, and cheerfulness of the greater part of mankind. He's saying, you know, that, that many Christians object that man does more good than he does evil. Okay? He says, how absurd that is. Then he says, infinitely more absurd than it would be to insist that the domestic of a prince was not a bad servant, because though sometimes he condemned and affronted his master to a great degree, yet he did not spit in his master's face so often as he performed acts of service. Or then it would be to affirm that his spouse was a good wife to him, because although she committed adultery, and that with the slaves and scoundrels sometimes, yet she did not do this so often as she did the duties of a wife. Okay. So again, they did more good and less evil, but does that really argue that they're not totally depraved? Now, Edwards did not believe that man ever did anything good. He, he agreed with Paul. He believed what Paul wrote. There is none who does good, but he's arguing that even if we could do something good, it couldn't possibly outweigh the bad things that we do. You know, Jonathan Edwards also pointed out that when we obey God, we're not, we're not meriting anything, okay, because that is our duty. God made us. He created us. We owe him absolute obedience. We gain absolutely nothing by obeying him, okay? But when we disobey him, that earns infinite demerits, infinite guilt. But again, Paul's point is we never do anything good. We always do everything wrong. Now, again, how can we say that? Because don't we see people doing, you know, good works, uh, even people who aren't Christians, you know, philanthropists and so forth, who, whose maybe objective in life is to raise money and to help people that, um, that can't help themselves? Well, this is something else we need to remember, that even when we do the right thing, I'm thinking as, as unbelievers, okay, even when we are unbelievers and we did the right thing, okay, when we obeyed the commandments, Apart from his grace, remember, we never did it for the right reasons. In order for a work to be good, it has to be according to the commandment. It has to be out of a pure love for God and a desire to do it for his glory and his honor. And the fact is that no unbeliever loves him at all or does these things for his glory. So why do these philanthropists, why do they give their money? Why do they do these good works? Well. They, did, they do it and we did it, the things that we did, because it benefits us in some way. It benefits us and not the Lord. And so that obedience always falls short. You know, John, John Gerstner had this, this term that he used for it. He called them bad good works. Okay? They're good works, the things God commands, but they're done with the wrong motive. That makes them bad good works. You know, good good works would be good works done with the right motive. And then bad, bad works, of course, would be things that are done that are evil uh, out of an evil motive. So the best that the unconverted person can do is a bad, good work. Well, because our whole being is affected by sin, we can't even receive the gift of God's grace that he offers to us in the gospel. Remember what we saw not too long ago, what Jesus said in John 6, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. You know, he says later, the flesh profits nothing. And if we could come to Jesus Christ and trust in him savingly out of the power of our flesh without the Holy Spirit, it would profit us a great deal. The flesh profits nothing. It is the Spirit who gives life. And God the Father gives the Holy Spirit to those that he draws to Christ. And we cannot come unless... He does that unless he enables us, unless he compels us from within by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, Paul goes on from this first opening statement to really spell out how total depravity affects everything we do. He says it affects our perception of God. There is none who understands. Now, he doesn't say exactly what it is they don't understand, but it's not that God exists. It's not necessarily who he is and what he is. It's not exactly his will. But what they don't understand would be the, the beauty of God 
and the glory of God and the, uh, just the amiableness of following his commandments because they are good. We don't see his glory. We don't see his loveliness. Consequently, he says, there is none who seeks for God. That is, who seeks him because he is lovely, because he is beautiful. When the, when the Father draws us to Christ and gives us a spirit, that's what enables us to do that. But without the spirit, we cannot do that. Now, last week, and as I've already reviewed as we were starting, last week we considered that where people don't seek, we need to seek for them. Like John the Baptist, we need to give them motives to seek after him. Well, here's one motive that we can't give them because they'll never be able to appreciate it. It can't be God's beauty and his glory because the unbeliever is blind to these things. Again, let me use Jonathan Edwards. He says, we can no more explain the beauty, this is paraphrase, we can no more explain the beauty of God's holiness to an unregenerate man then we can explain color to a blind man or music to one who was born deaf. And what he meant by that is he doesn't have the spirit. He doesn't have the faculty in order to appreciate God's glory and his beauty. So those are just empty motives as far as they're concerned. Jonathan Edwards talked about, you know, how he motivated people to respond to the gospel. And there were two motivations. There's heaven, which may be a long ways off. And then there's, there's hell. And he said, heaven, they didn't respond to it because it wasn't interesting to them. But hell was something they were very interested in because they did not want to go there. So we need to be able to give them motives that they can understand, motives that they can appreciate. And those motives are God is holy and they are sinful and that God is going to judge them one day for their sins. Now, if the Spirit wakes them up to seek God from this kind of motivation, they will seek Him, but purely out of self-preservation because they do not want to go to hell. Now, Paul continues, we've, we've all turned aside from God and His ways. We've all become useless. That is, we're all worthless. We're all debased. And then he closes with that statement again, none of us do what's good, not even one of us. Well, so this is man's condition, and we know what that means and what that would have meant for us apart from Christ and what it means for those still who are outside of Christ. Paul already told us in Romans chapter 2, because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you were storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Those who do not repent and turn to Christ, the Bible says, this is God's word, it's absolutely true, they will perish forever in hell, where Jesus tells us the fire is never quenched, and where John writes, the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night. Now, how do people who believe in annihilationism uh, deal with, with this passage? They have no rest day and night. Their torment goes on forever and ever. Now, remember, this was our condition when the Lord found us. That was our future. That's what we would have had to endure. And the Lord saved us. We need to remember this is our neighbor's um, condition and their future. Now, the interesting thing is, as we, as we start be begin to look at uh, the, the second point is, even when we were unconverted, we likely thought that we were better than this, right? Better than this description. <laughs> we may have thought we did good things. We're not so bad. And maybe we thought when we came to Christ, I just have to grow a little bit to become like him. You know, I'm, I'm just about there. But the fact is, we weren't. Our neighbor definitely thinks that they're better than this, okay? But they're not. Now, we need to help them understand that they're not. But we also need to understand, you know, we also need to understand that they're not, okay? Otherwise, we're not going to reach out to help them. So that raises this question. If what Paul says is really true about our neighbors, why don't they seem to be as bad as what the Bible represents? You know, why didn't we seem to be as, as that bad to ourselves, you know, before coming to Christ? 
I hope you can remember that, you know, uh, what you were like, at least what you thought at the time. I'm not thinking, not talking about what you know now, because remember what the Apostle Paul said is, as he's the end, nearing the end of his life, and he's, I, I, well, he's, where he's writing is from his second Roman imprisonment, and he's going to be executed, and he says something to the effect, it's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Not that I was before he saved me, but that I am at the end of my life, okay? Because we know as Christians, the Spirit of God opens our eyes to see our sins. We see those imperfections now, but we didn't see them then. And the question is, why didn't we see them, okay? Well, the answer is God's common grace, common grace. Now, remember grace, the word grace, not just common grace, but any kind of grace, refers to any undeserved benefit that we receive from God. Now, again, we're, we're, you know, guilty, totally depraved, hate God, we're his enemies. That's how the Bible characterizes us, and that's what's true of us. So when God gives us anything good, it's always undeserved. Common grace is where, you know, we, what Jesus talks about. Um, I want you to be merciful, okay? Because your heavenly Father is merciful, he is kind to the ungrateful uh, and, and to the wicked. He causes his sun to shine on both and his rain to fall on both. You know, he's, he, he gives them good, okay? Grace refers to any undeserved benefit that we receive from God. Mercy is not getting something bad that we deserve, bad in the sense that we wouldn't like it, and that would be God's judgment. Even though that's good, God's judgment is good, it's not received as good by the people who have to endure it, okay? Mercy is not getting judgment. So grace is getting any good that we do not deserve. So this grace, though, falls into two categories, redemptive and non-redemptive. Now, we're very familiar with this redemptive grace. We've just gone through great lengths to try to describe all the things that go into this. We've even done it tonight. We deserve damnation for our sins. But God didn't give us that. He showed us mercy. And he gave us something we don't deserve, eternal life as a free gift through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's given to us grace. He's shown us mercy and grace. That's redemptive grace. The common grace is the non-redemptive goodness of God which he gives to all mankind. Again, the sun and the rain. Now, the Noahic Covenant, which I'm sure we're all familiar with because we, I think not too long ago, read through Genesis, but it refers to that covenant that God made with Noah and his children and with all the creatures after the flood, okay? It was a, a covenant of common grace because it guaranteed benefits for the entire world. Now, as I was looking at that, there was a, a longer statement of it and then a very short one. I'm going to give you the short one for the sake of time. In Genesis 8:22, the Lord said, While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Now, the other lengthier quote included, I will not destroy the world again with the flood. And here is the sign of my covenant. I'll put the rainbow in the heavens. Every time you see it, then you'll know, and remember my promise, I'm not going to destroy the world, but I'm going to preserve it. And while I preserve it, I'm going to continue to grant these blessings, these common uh, good things to all of my creatures. And the reason why he does that is so that he might carry out his redemptive purposes. Okay? Now, he does this because he's good because God is good and because all mankind are his children. And God is giving to these wayward children who aren't going to be saved their inheritance, so to speak. Remember the rich man and Lazarus? Uh, you know, to the rich man, he says, in this life, you've received your good things, and Lazarus is bad. Now, now, uh, you're, now he's being comforted, and you're in, in torment. So he received his good things. You know, God has an inheritance even for... Uh, those made in his image that never will come to faith in Christ because he is good, because he's a faithful father. Again, Jesus says in Luke 6.35, he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. But he has also done this 
to make sure that the world continues until he has gathered in all of Christ's sheep. So you might say the common grace is given so that the work of redemptive grace can continue. Because just think, think about this for a minute. Think of what would happen if God only gave these good gifts to his children and withheld them from everyone else. Okay, what would happen? Well, the wicked would descend on the righteous and they would kill them and take everything they have. You know, I, as I was thinking about that, I thought of this, um, this old Twilight Zone episode. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's very telling. It's called The Shelter. It's a story about all these neighbors, you know, they're, they're, they love each other, they have this wonderful neighborhood, and they're meeting together, and they're, they're having dinner together, and they, they, everybody just, you know, is so friendly and loving towards one another. But then the air raid siren sounds, and only one of these families has, has a uh, bomb shelter, and everybody thinks they're going to die, and so this family goes into the bomb shelter, and what do you think all these loving people do uh, who are afraid they're going to die? Well, they do everything they can to break into that shelter. They become animals. And then the, the twist, there's always a twist at the end. It turns out to be a false alarm. So now what does this neighbor who had the shelter think of all of his other neighbors? He's seen their true nature, right? Well, that's, um, you see, like I said, if God did not give his, his good gifts to all of mankind, they would all descend on us like those neighbors did, uh, the family that had the bomb shelter. So that's, that's one way that God restrains sin, okay, is by giving good gifts to all mankind, but his goodness also restrains sin in other ways, okay? Jonathan Edwards notes that this total depravity that we're referring to really makes man the same in his character, in his heart, as the devil, where there is no spirit that equals no love for God and really ultimate hatred and evil. And if God did not restrain that sin, man would be just as bad. Again, the illustration of the, of the shelter. But he does restrain it in, in a variety of ways, by giving good gifts to, to men, but also directly by his Holy Spirit. You know, the Spirit of God works through conscience, makes people, you know, hurt, feel guilty when they do things that are wrong, rewards them when they do things that are right, makes them feel good. So they, they want to do what's right and not what's wrong at least until they sear their conscience and they can't feel it anymore because of their sin. But the Spirit of God restrains sin in that way. And he also restrains sin through, uh, through his law because the law tells you what is right and wrong and threatens judgment for the breaking of it. The law within the conscience is, and especially the moral law, and, and both of those laws are essentially the same. Through just penalties, in society for breaking those laws. That restrains most people. You know, I had a friend who had a Camaro and, and he um, it had a rag top, you know, it was convertible. And he used to put the rag top up everywhere he'd go and when he'd park the car and he'd lock the doors. I said, well, why do you do that? They can get through the rag top so easily. And he says, well, I know that if somebody really wants to get in, you're not gonna be able to stop them. But I, I put this up just to keep honest people honest, okay? So there's differing degrees of what a person is willing to do. But these laws that penalize people restrains their, their sins. And even society itself can restrain our sin. Okay, what, what other people think about you. You know, think about what you think and how you respond to things when you're by yourself and what you're doing versus when other people are watching you. Okay, there's a difference because we want people to think well of us. And, and that's one of the ways that the Spirit of God also, God in His common grace, restrains sin. And these are very, you know, generally very effective in curbing sin, except, of course, in the case of hardened criminals, sociopaths who really don't care. You know, my systematics professor had another illustration that I thought was helpful, and he used the, uh, the book that's called Heart of Darkness. And apparently it's the story of a man who left society, um, perhaps from Europe, to go to the dark continent, to the heart of darkness, okay, Africa, only to discover when he got there, without the societal restraints and the people who knew him and the laws and the penalties, all that's gone. And now he discovers that the heart of darkness really was in him and not in Africa. 
So essentially, in summary, this is what we've seen. God tells us that our neighbors are affected in all parts with sin. They're totally depraved. They're not as bad as they could be, but they have nothing of the Spirit of God in them. We need to understand that. They share the same nature as the devil. They do not love him. Okay? And they're not able to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're on their way to a Christless eternity, to judgment forever. But they most often do not appear to be as bad as they actually are, either to us or to them or to themselves, because of God's common restraint on their sin. Because of all the things we've just seen, the spirits working, conscience, society, the law, penalties, all these things are at work to make them you know, less, um, you might say, less aggressive. Uh, but under the right conditions, they might become as aggressive as anyone else. But we need to make sure that we understand that. Okay, so we don't make the same mistake that young man did who was headed to the mission field. And the, maybe the mistake that we've also made in our own lives, that thinking they're really not that bad and they're really not in that much danger. Okay, they are that bad. And so are in serious danger. And we need to point them to Jesus as the only way that they can ever escape God's judgment. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer. Let's ask the Lord to help us um, understand, accept, and, and be able to apply this.